the British economy is booming at this time, with now government spending accounting for 29% of the country's GDP, as orders for iron, steel, coal and timber increase, as the British government tried to produce weapons, ships, uniforms and to feed their European allies. The production of pig iron in particular booms. I mean, Britain goes from producing around 68,000 tons of pig iron from 1788 to 325,000 tons of 1811. By 1811, it's the, it's the forge of the Industrial Revolution, as Britain industrialises to cope with the demands of war. The cotton industry was new at the start of the war, but with the demands for uniforms and for the demand for clothing, as we're deprived of imports from Europe, means it soon, by 1815, becomes our largest export. There are new docks, new canals, turnpike roads and iron railways all built. The national debt triples as Britain goes to a full war footing. Tax levels soar and from 1793 to 1815. Tax income was £1.217 billion and yet still the government was borrowing around £25 million annually. Against this, the British blockade of France caused an industrial collapse in France. The industrial output of the French city of Marseille, for example, fell by 75%, deprived of raw materials from the globe and denied access to its markets. Instead, the French are turning to plunder. After the Battle of Jena, Prussia had to pay the French 311 million francs as, a, as war reparations. From 1805 to 1812, Half of all of Italy's taxes had to be paid to France to fund the French war effort for protection money. In 1809, desperate to try and get away from the plundering French system, Austria declares war on France again. The British win a series of battles in Spain, and like, for example, the most famous being Talavera, underneath the command of Sir Arthur Wellesley. But Austria is crushed again at the Battle of the Gram, despite initial success against the French armies at the Battle of Aspern, Esselin. But despite its victories, France is starting to run out of experienced men. Even a victory won leads to a lot of loss of life, and there's still an open sore of Spain and Portugal, where a British army under Sir Arthur Wellesley is rampaging around, trying to help the Spanish and Portuguese. So the French had lost 44,000 dead at Aspern, Esselin, and even winning at Vagram, they had lost 30,000 dead. By 1811, the running sore of Spain has, has swallowed up 353,000 French soldiers. <coughs> Spain is also a very big help to the British as a market for British goods, and it gives access, the British access to its, the Spanish powerful fleet. As soon as Spain changes size to join us, it leads in fact to an export boom for British industry, as around £11 million pounds of extra goods are exported from between 1808 to 1810. Now the French claim to be fighting for liberty, but we have here the words of a historian to sum up their, uh, what they had become. They conquered non-French populations, stationed armies amongst them, they taxed their goods, they disrupted their trade, they raised, they raised indemnities, taxes and conscripted their youth, all to feed their rapacious war effort. In 1810, Russia tries to leave the continental system, and France repairs for war with Russia. From 1810 to 1812, they gather a vast multinational European army to finally smash the Russians once and for all. 600 and, well, around around 600,000 men. Of these, only around 270,000 are French. But they've taken people from Italy, from Poland, from Belgium, all as a grand European coalition to smash the Tsar. Meanwhile, America has declared war on Britain and seeks to invade Canada. The British, however, win another major victory in Spain, the Battle of Salamanca. The French army under Napoleon invades Russia, wins a series of stunning victories, including the bloody Battle of Borodino, just before the gates of Moscow. The losses are horrible but they managed to capture Moscow. But Moscow itself is burnt to the ground by the Russians, who would rather see there be no Moscow than a French-occupied 
Moscow. And so a French army is now stuck in the middle of the Russian winter, a cruel Russian winter, with nowhere to stay. They'd hoped to stay in winter in Moscow, but the, the Russians have burnt the city to the ground. And so from October to December 1812, they are forced to retreat from Moscow. Not retreating from the Russian army, but from the snows. It is the death of an army. Of all the things the Russians had achieved, the burning of their own capital city was the grave of the French army. The French lose 270,000 dead and 200,000 prisoner. And so 470,000 of this 600,000 grand army don't leave Russia. The French military power is broken by the Russian winter and the burning of Moscow. Seeing their chance, the Prussians, Russians, Swedes and Austrians are given vast amounts of British money and equipment to turn on the French. The Russian army, for example, had halted initially at the Russian border, but now cross the border to join their allies. The French in 1813 desperately scrape up another 145,000 men, but they're inexperienced and ill uh, and ill trained. The Prussians attack the French, but the French try and hold the line against now a hostile coalition in Saxony. The then, my, meanwhile, in Spain, the British army is continuing to gain ground, and Sir Arthur Wellesley smashes a French army at Vittoria and then drives into France itself through Spain. The Austrians join in the war against the French with an army of a quarter of a million men. And we have here the War of the Sixth Coalition, the Battle of Leipzig. Austria, Russia, Sweden and Russia all fighting against the French at the Battle of Leipzig. It's known as the Battle of Nations. 365,000 men of an allied army from across Europe against 195,000 Frenchmen. In a time when most battles were a few hours, this battle lasted for four days. And the French, who arguably won the first day, are smashed at Leipzig. With their army already destroyed in Russia, their new desperately raised one beaten at Leipzig, and a British army now in southern France. The war, then, is effectively over. Prussian and, uh, Prussian and Austrian troops cross the Rhine, and in 1814, France surrenders, and the USA signs a peace with the British Empire. However, Napoleon himself put in prison, taken to chains, but not killed, will return, of course. The idea was that we could hold him in prison, that in, a, in the Mediterranean, that he would, because he, he was seen as a, a menace to the freedom of Europe, the fact that we hoped that we could hold him in prison and it would be an end to the war. However, of course, famously he escapes. He returns to France. A French army is sent to arrest him underneath the command of one of his old generals, Marshal Ney. That French army doesn't arrest him. They join him and he marches triumphant to Paris. All of Europe is horrified by the return of Napoleon to power in France. And so all of Europe declares war on France to remove Napoleon for the second time from France. He knows he needs to win a war quickly. His idea is to drive the British into the sea and smash the Prussians. The British and Prussian armies were going to join in Belgium. And so the French will invade Belgium to destroy the Prussians and British. His hope was that if he can destroy the Prussians and British, he could then swing his army to fight the Russians as they try and, and Austrians as they cross the Rhine, taking his enemies one by one in a classic Napoleonic move. This British army will be led by Sir Arthur Wellesley. And so for the first time, Napoleon and Sir Arthur Wellesley actually clash upon the battlefield in the campaign of the Hundred Days that ends in the Battle of Waterloo. Famously, the British helped immensely by Blücher, in fact, in many ways, saved by Blücher and the Prussian army, managed to beat Napoleon, and Napoleon is removed for the second time from power in France sent back to an Atlantic prison this time, instead of a Mediterranean one, and then probably poisoned with poisoned wallpaper by the British as he died a suspiciously early death. The war is followed by the Treaty of Vienna, which remakes Europe and makes it into the Europe that we know from the First World War. And so for the next video, we'll look at the consequences of the Napoleonic Wars.